Hello, you're watching Entertainment Week with me, Isabel Webster. Coming up on today's show, the X-Men are back again. Hugh Jackman will explain how Wolverine nearly ended up with a perm. Josh Hartnett joins us to talk monsters and murders and why he fancies being the first American James Bond. And we have a legend of the West End here in the studio, the first lady of musical theatre, Elaine Page, will be telling us about her new TV show and her farewell tour. First, let's catch up on the week's entertainment news. We learned Jay-Z may have more than 99 problems after footage from a hotel lift was leaked online, showing his sister-in-law, Solange, making her feelings known with a clutch bag. But all was forgiven as big sister Beyonce posted pics of the pair on Instagram. The trio say they're moving forward as a united family. There have been calls for Gary Barlow to give his OBE back for good after he and his Take That bandmates put money in a tax avoidance scheme. Carolina Hearns revealed she's fighting lung cancer. She's had the disease before in her bladder and eye. Over on the French Riviera, the stars have been out for the Cannes Film Festival. Prince William hung out with another Kate and a few more famous faces at a charity dinner. And a beautiful bearded lady stole our hearts at Eurovision. Could a duet with Gaga be next? Boy George had twittered, I love it. And Lady Gaga had twittered, Conchita Wurst, you complete me. Well, Elaine, it is wonderful to have you with us. We're going to be talking about your brand new show in just a moment. But first of all, we're going to talk about a few of those big stories of the week as we check out what's been trending online. Sophie Haywood is with us. And really, we just have to start with the Jay-Z and Solange footage that was leaked from that lift. And that everybody I know has watched about 10 times. Oh. Yeah, it's extraordinary. I mean, it's me. so many things to talk about. You didn't see it today, <laughs> no, but you just shocked at just quite how bad. So what <laughs> we're looking at here is Beyonce's sister attacking her brother-in-law, Jay-Z. Wow. Oh, I see. Yeah. Violent. Yeah. And it's it quite interesting on... watching the interplay between all the characters, isn't it? Because actually Jay-Z doesn't re retaliate. And believe it or not, Beyonce is standing just there and does very little to, to stop it's the It's funny, it makes you wonder if Beyonce is used to seeing this because <laughs> she's not massively surprised. Or at the same time, it could be that her and Jay are so much more famous than Solange. They are so used to the public eye that they know, even in a lift, there's going to be a camera, there's a security guard who might sell a story. You know, they know they just have to be composed at all times. It's interesting because I've actually met Solange in Los Angeles. We had a night out together <laughs> some years ago and she was the sweetest person. I was pregnant at the time and I remember her sort of rubbing my tummy with the gentlest rub and then saying, let me show you my stretch marks because she has a nine-year-old yeah. son. So something's provoked it then. Something's <laughs> yeah. provoked and it. We, now we, how are we going to find out what? That's the thing. The whole world wants to know. We all want to know. I fear we may never. We have to talk about Batman as well though. Why is everybody talking about Ben Affleck? People were so horrified when Ben Affleck got the gig of playing Batman and I didn't understand it. He seemed quite a sort of brooding, manly actor to me. I didn't see it to be such a, an, a bad fit. But I think the thing is, you're dealing here with comic book nerds who are not going to be happy with anything. But you can't Batman see obsessives. who it is anyway. Well, quite. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it hardly matters who's playing it, does yeah. it? And Sophie, we have to talk about Michael Jackson as well. This new video has been released featuring, of course, uh, Justin Timberlake. Yes. Tell us all about it. Well, Michael Jackson has released his second posthumous album this week. It's not even the first one. This one they've gone through through some old unleased material and they've got Timberland, the producer, to do it. So it's actually quite a lot better. There's some good songs. I don't think we're missing any huge hits from him, but it's it's good. Well, that's one to check out if you haven't already. Sophie Hayward, thank you ever so much. And the final story there, of course, the opening of the Cannes Film Festival. Let's go to Steve Hargrave, who is there for us. So Steve, loads of huge names descending on the Mediterranean. Who's hitting the headlines? Well, the biggest one, I guess we should talk about it, really, although she probably doesn't want to be reminded, was the opening night film, Grace of Monaco. Nicole Kidman, of course, starring as Grace Kelly, who's a member of the royal family just down the coast in Monaco. The Monaco family themselves have disowned this film. And it has to be said, although Nicole put in a great effort on the red carpet, coming down, smiling and posing, there's a big red carpet, this one. The reviews, of course, were not fair the following morning. I'll read a couple of quotes out from some of the reviews. Nicole, if you're listening, just you know, cover your ears for a second. Uh, stiff, stagey, thunderingly earnest, cardboard, side-spittingly funny, although it's not meant to be a comedy, and so wooden, it's a fire risk, said The Guardian. So Nicole won't be happy with those reviews. But it is kind of more about 
being seen out here in Cannes. And what we've seen since, Nicole, is all of the stars starting to flood in. Big Hollywood stars, Matthew McConaughey was spotted. And also out on the carpet at these big parties, the ladies putting in a stellar performances in their frocks. Lots of British interest, though, on the film side of thing this year, isn't there, Steve? Yeah, it's quite funny as well, because just behind me at the moment, Mike Lee is doing interviews just over there uh, for his film, Mr. Turner. Now, if we talk about Nicole's film being slated, Mr. Turner is a movie that, after he walked down the red carpet with his cast, including Timothy Spall as the, uh, the, the title character, he got some fantastic reviews. Five stars pretty much across the board from the British press and also a lot of interest. He's a bit of a can darling, Mike Lee, and I spoke to him earlier. And he says he does want to win the Palm Door, which he's up against. And interestingly, he's going up against Ken Loach, who's got a film here called Jimmy's Hall, which is a 1930s Irish uh, political activist film. Again, Ken Loach has previous form, has won before, and those two are seen as very, very strong competitors to pick up the Palm Door come the end of the week. So strong British interest on the directing front. A lot of other British stars in town and a lot of uh, British journalists it has to be said trying to get to the free alcohol at the parties on the beach. And lots of A-listers wanting to come and party as well. Other big names expected over the course of the next week? Yeah I, I know you're very excited about this because uh, the Ryans are in town. Ryan Reynolds rocked up today actually for the premiere and launch of his big movie uh, called The Captive. In the film he sports a big beard. He didn't have a beard today but he was certainly trying to appear a bit older. Some saying this was meant to be the performance that sort of got him back in, in line with the critics really after doing some slightly less successful movies. Uh, but it has to be said again, the reaction from the Cannes crowd today, not that favourable for Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Gosling, the other Ryan, I think you might have heard of him. He's got his directorial debut called Lost River. That's interesting to us because Doctor Who's Matt Smith pops up in that, as does Christina Hendricks from Mad Men. And then finally, of course, Robert Pattinson. He's here not just for one film, he's here for two films. But as I said before, it's not really about who wins that big award. It's more about being seen, being photographed, and having the biggest dazzling smile on that red carpet. Oh, Steve Hargrave, thank you so much. A tough gig you've got there, but I'm sure you'll find time to enjoy yourself. Now, it's hard to imagine what musical theatre would have been like without my next guest. During her 50 years on the stage, she's played iconic parts in hit shows like Cats, Evita and Sunset Boulevard. Now, Elaine Page is turning her attention to television with a new Sky Arts show. Let's take a look. Don't pray for me. So, Elaine, we can get all sorts of things from your brand new show, including performances from you. Yes. What else can we expect? Well, I'm singing the opening and closing song um, on the other six programmes that are shown on Wednesday night at 8 o'clock and Sky One at 6.30 on a Saturday. Um, I have other guests on, on from musical theatre. Um, a creative person like Dame Gillian Lynn, uh, Tim Rice, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Trevor Nunn, and then peppered through the conversation because it's sort of like a chat show with musical performances. So, so it's for lovers of all things musical theatre and you're wheeling in your showbiz friends. That's, Who was your favourite guest in the series? Oh my goodness, that's terribly unfair <laughs> because uh, everybody is unique and uh, each performance and conversation that I had was uh, one very different from another. Uh, Maureen Lippman was on one week and she loves to tell a good tale and she's very funny so that was a rather good programme but it's a, it's a bit of a mix and of course uh, plus the, the, the guests that perform and, and that I interview. Uh, each week I have a young uh, student from a drama school uh, from uh, Arts Education or Mount View and they come on and, and we've worked together on a song that they want to perform and it gives them an opportunity to know what it's like to be in a television studio for their well, first ever sort of outing there. as it were. So in a way you're getting involved in people as they're sort of starting their career. Because yes. I know you've been outspoken about being critical of these sort of talent shows that thrust people into the spotlight and they haven't necessarily worked their way up the hard way like you did. So is this your way of sort of trying to help people yes, lot, trying to out. address the balance, if you like, for, for uh, drama students who take on a three-year course, you know, and go and work hard and study at a slower pace. That's the thing that I think I'm more concerned with, really. And this gives them the opportunity. Uh, they're they're third-year students, so they've done almost their entire uh, course, and it gives them an opportunity to know what it's like to actually to, to work in a television studio and, and to work on a song and, and, and the storytelling, because that's what it's all about.
all about. And you've had your own radio show for 10 years. Now yeah. you have this TV show. Are we going to see more of this kind of thing? Because you're doing your farewell tour this year. Yes. Packing your bags and saying no more. Well, I'm not exactly retiring that terrible world. No, not indeed. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm really just hanging up my touring shoes, really. It's just the travelling that has become a bit of a bind. The new album, that's great fun because it's all the Warner tracks uh, from about mid 80s through to date and we found some extra tracks that we'd forgotten all about in the archive so we put those on it for for fans and I've done a dance track of Be On Your Own from the musical Nine <laughs> so it's it's quite an eclectic mix of songs. And you, you're very adamant that you're not planning to retire anytime soon. A lot of people who are in musical theatre say they never will, they can't, it's in their blood, is that how you feel? Well it is really, I mean it is a bit like a drug you know, it's something <laughs> that you've done all your life and to the, I can't imagine not doing it but of course musical theatre is very much I always think now a young person's game because it is so demanding mm. both physically and vocally and and you've got to be really at the the, the peak of your health and uh, you know you've, you've got to be really fit to do it and, and of course I like to enjoy a little of real life as well now of so um, so this is going to afford me to be able to do some one-off concerts keep recording albums and hopefully uh, to, to you know, keep my toes dipped into the world of television. Well, there's still certainly a huge amount of appetite to see you. It's been an absolute pleasure talking Thanks to you. We so wish much. you all the best with all the things you've got planned for 2014. <laughs> Elaine Page, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, coming up in a few moments, Josh Hartnett will be here in the studio to tell us why he's returning to TV after 15 years with the new drama, Penny Dreadful. And don't miss our film review for all this week's big releases. Now, some of the scariest monsters in literature are coming to our TV screens next week. The new drama, Penny Dreadful, manages to combine vampires, Frankenstein, Egyptian mummies, and even Dorian Gray makes an appearance. In a moment, we'll talk to the show's gun-toting cowboy, Josh Hartnett. But first, let's see him in action. So it's a job, this night work? Yes. Something of a criminal setup? Would it matter? Not at all. Then why ask? The show's heading off to Paris pretty soon. The job's tonight. Is it a murder? Would it matter? One smile and I say yes. Meet me at this address at 11 o'clock. I don't know London. Then ask a policeman. You have a name? Reels you in. So it's set in Victorian Britain. Yes. How would you describe the show? Well, it's set in 1891. Uh, a lot of the characters from classic uh, English, especially English literature, that have a uh, horror bent to them are living in London at the same time and treated as actual people and going about their daily life. And my character is an American who comes in at an inauspicious time and is kind of brought along to some very supernatural events with. Uh, with by Eva Green's character. And, and how important were the other players in it for you in enticing you into doing this? Because it's got a lot of sort of bond mm -hmm. connections, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah, well, John Logan wrote Skyfall as well. So he created this and wrote Skyfall. Sam obviously directed Skyfall. Um, and uh, and Tim being Bond, Ava being a Bond girl. There are a lot of Bond connections. Rory Kinnear's in it as well. He's in, he's in the Skyfall as well. Um, I thought that maybe they were grooming me to be the first American Bond, but I doubt that that's going to be the case. <laughs> I mean, I wonder what enticed you to the small screen again, because we're used to you from the big Hollywood blockbusters. We haven't seen you for a few years. This is the first time you've been back on TV since your debut, when you were 18 years old. Yeah, it's been a long time since I've done television. The reason that I wanted to do this was not so much, it, it wasn't about the format, it was about the people involved. Like you said, the, that list of people is pretty impressive. Um, Juan Bayona also is not to be overlooked. He's the he's the man who directed the first two episodes, and he's a really he's an incredibly talented director. So it's all about for me. It's all about the collaborators, and in these days you go back and forth between TV and film very easily, much more easily than it was for someone from TV to move into film back when I sure. I did it. It's such a gory gory series, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot of blood, there's a lot of guts. How mm -hmm. did you personally stomach that? Well, it's not it's not very hard on set because. It's obviously like you know made of corn syrup, but uh, but the 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 gore is I think a good way to get audiences involved at the beginning. But I but really it's I mean you look at the people who are involved. It's not 
it's not about the gore and the blood and the guts and the scares. It's about the characters and how they grow and how they interact. Did it mean, though, that there was a lot of time in makeup and a lot of time doing sort of all the... Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. I and mean, yeah. how do you find that? Do you enjoy that kind of creative side to it, or you prefer to just get it's on something and do different. the job? Well, you know, it's something different. No, I, I, I'm not so old and jaded that I would, you know, get... Uh, that I wouldn't <laughs> enjoy a new experience. Yeah. Some, uh, some of these things are, are new. I've done some things on this show that I've had... I haven't had a chance to do before. Um, I don't know if you saw it in that clip. I don't think you did, but I get to gunsling in this show, so I had to learn how to spin guns and shoot accurately from the hip. And, and do you that like fun. that side of the of job? Course, that was quite yeah. a physical, because you've been described yeah. as a sort of natural athlete, and that's why a lot oh, of these really? leading roles come hmm. to you, and I wonder if that's a side to it that you particularly enjoy doing your own stunts, for example. And natural athlete. Wow, I'll, <laughs> I'll take that. I'll pay, um, pay me later. Yeah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> I... Uh, yeah, no, I love the I love doing the stunt stuff. I love just I love learning a new skill, whether it's physical or or if it's you know I mean I I don't I love learning a new card trick, you know I mean if you have something that you have to do for work that's so unusual like that that's 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 a bonus. In terms of your own career, I know that you were in talk certainly with with Superman Returns, and there's there's rumors that you you were lined up to be in Spider Man and and these other big action roles. Do you regret having not taken those or followed that path? I don't have any career regrets. I've done I think some of the my best work in the last few years um, within very worthy films. It's just not, unless you're doing the few very big blockbusters every year, there's not the kind of money in advertising that you get for like a television show like this. We have in this show, I think, more advertising than any film I've done since Black Rock Down. And I've been in some studio films that have had less advertising, and I've been in a lot of independent films that have had a lot less advertising. So it may seem to some people in the public like I went away, but really I was just working with I think really interesting and worthy directors in independent film. When you did do those, those films, Pearl Harbor, Black Hawk mm. Down, early 20s, really hard yeah. to handle that kind of fame in your early 20s. Mm. What's, what was it like being, being a Hollywood star that was sort of thrust into, into the spotlight so young? Well, it was like a lot of things. I don't really know. I mean, we were, when we shot Black Hawk Down, I was 21 years old. And um, when we completed it not long after, I was living in New York. And obviously it was September 2001. Uh, everything sort of changed. And I took quite a few steps back after that, moved back to Minnesota, spent a lot of time writing and um, <clears throat> doing some doing charity work and and uh, and just wasn't interested in playing, I guess, what was expected of me in, in the game in Hollywood. Uh, but now, with a few more years under my belt, it feels it feel I mean, this is as good a job as I could ever hope for. I love working in film and TV and I've had a great time on this and hope to continue. Mm. Well Josh, we wish you all the very best with this. Of thank course, you very much. So this is going to be on on Tuesday night on Sky Atlantic, Penny Dreadful. Air. So thank you very much for thank talking you. to us about Thanks it. Thanks a lot. Time now to see what's on at the cinema this weekend. In a moment we'll speak to our film reporter Joe, but in the meantime, let's take a look at our first pick, Godzilla. <laughs> So, $160 million budget reportedly. Is this just about special effects? Um, a, a little bit, yeah. I mean, I think that's probably a fair point to say, but it's not in the, just about special effects in the same way as sort of the Avengers is and all those and Transformers, which is just sort of rendered pixels beating seven bells out of each other. It has got a heart. Bill suspense incredibly well, in fact. We don't actually see Godzilla until the, sort of the first hour. It's sort of Spielberg and Jaws-esque in the fact that we're just waiting to see this monster. And when you've got that tease, you're always going to have a big reveal, and the reveal's got to be worth it. And when we do see him, and when we do see him sort of uh, reducing much of West Coast America to rubbles, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And much of it is sort of told through the human point of view as well, sort of shaky cam and through uh, TV news reports and so it's grounded in realism so you never sort of think this is a computer character beating up another computer character it's easily the best disaster film I've seen in 15 years okay. it's absolutely fantastic where it kind of like falls a bit short when you compare it to things like Independence Day and Titanic you know the great disaster movies of our but modern era. what would you era. give it out of 10? If you had uh, to. A strong seven. Well let's move on to the two faces of January to me this seems to be very much in the sort of vein of the English patient. 
Yeah, it's uh, evocative, it's classy, it's really old school. It's, I mean, it really is a film noir, sort of sort of like a Casablanca-esque movie. It's the kind of films that they don't make anymore. It's uh, tightly woven and every line matters. There's never any sort of superfluous and wasted dialogue in this film. And, it, and, and you just sit there and you enjoy it. And the three leads are absolutely fantastic. And it's, it's old school glamour and excellence. Let's take a look at it. There's a young guy in a grey shirt staring at me. She's very pretty, isn't she? What are you doing in Athens? I'm a tour guide. You're American. Do you believe me? You can ask him yourself. He's going to show us around the flea market Sunday. What do you do for a living, sir? I uh, look after people's savings. They want you to uh, join us for dinner. <laughs> so, what do you think? Wouldn't trust him to mow my lawn. Mr. Dunleavy? No, so I think you get Absolutely wrong. stunning cinematography. You kind of want to jump into the screen, don't you? It sucks you in. It transports you back to 1960s Europe when sort of men walked about abandoned ruins in linen suits and everyone looked beautiful and uh, you travelled, you know, without sun lounges and eating English fry-ups. It, it's a beautiful film. It takes you back to that period in time and it's well worth a watch. Well, in stark contrast to that, let's yeah. uh, preview what's coming out next week, the latest X-Men movie. Latest X-Men movie. This is when they sort of combine the two casts. So you've got the same character of Michael Fassbender, James McAvoy, along with Sir Ian McKellen and Sir Patrick Stewart. It's going to be interesting to see where it goes from here. If this is successful, you can imagine they will keep this cast together. But also, of course, you've got the, the spin standalone movies, Hugh Jackman, who's the ever-present in the saga. And when I spoke to Hugh Jackman, I took him back to that time in London when he had his first audition for the role of Wolverine. I was in London doing Oklahoma at the Royal National Theatre and I ran from the matinee, it was a Wednesday, I ran from the matinee into Soho to do a test and ran back and did the show. I had a perm in my hair, I had a really bad American accent, I think I just did my curly southern cowboy accent as Wolverine. How the hell I ever got a call back, I have no idea. So a slightly camp permed Wolverine was your initial take on that. There's nothing character. camp about Hurley, <laughs> uh, Curly. <laughs> But uh, no, I was, it, it, it was a miracle. It was Lauren Shulladonna, actually, who was the producer at the time, who saw it. I am forever grateful. She, is, <laughs> she saw something that I'm sure was not there. You go back to the 70s in this one. So yeah. really, your initial audition with the perm, <laughs> you, you were ready for it. <laughs> exactly. I was ahead <laughs> of my time. Look at the future, the trendsetter here. Exactly. I should have done that. Wolverine's... And even the leather chaps that I was wearing <laughs> straight from the audition. Yeah. He seems like this kind of character who fits into the 70s, though. He's got... I totally He's got the, the facial hair. Chops, the big belt buckle, the motorbike. Scotch. I motorbike. actually, you know, I kept that living throughout the thing. Like, he's in the 70s and he goes back and he gets into a car and the moment he turns it on, I was like, yeah. It's almost like everything's about it. Yeah. It's Wolverine stopped in the 70s, you know? The moment the 80s and Wham and Rick Astley came, it was like he checked out, I can imagine. <laughs> you, you go back in time as well. Now, every Hollywood movie where they go back in time, you can't upset the space-time continuum. Right. Even though no one has ever time-travelled. So how do we know <laughs> that that's true? We studied it at school. Yeah. You didn't oh, study you, it at no, school? It yeah. must be something you do in Australia. We well, don't I can tell you, Brian Singer takes it very seriously. Because, <laughs> yes, this is... I, he does. No, this is a... I think probably the secret to his success was he took mutation seriously. Uh, he used to show us articles and, and talk to us about why are we arrog so arrogant to think that we're fully evolved. We, we talk about evolution, but who's to say humans have uh, fully evolved? We don't use 80% of our brains, so maybe we're just at the beginning. So he used to sew that in all the time, and when it comes to time travel, He's as ambitious to make this the best time travel movie as he is to make it the best superhero movie. Uh, trust me. He's so personable, isn't he? And it wasn't just a Hugh Jackman that we managed to catch up with, but also Michael Fassbender to ask how he thought the X-Men franchise could continue. It's a business that we're part of, and obviously the, the next film doesn't get made unless the, the one before it makes money. Um, that's no secret there. Uh, is the marketplace saturated with superhero films in general at the moment? Some people would say yes, but other people would say, well, more people are going to the cinema than ever. Next time on Entertainment Week, Drew Barrymore and Adam Sandler are together again. They'll be telling us about achieving a work-life balance and whether a new perfume range could be on the cards. And Nick Frost's here in the studio to give us a taste of 1960s Watford in his new comedy, Mr Sloan.